Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Uncertainty is in the news, and a lot of it uh, stems around scientific issues. Uh, but science uh, is not the only place that uh, has uncertainty. Uncertainty is a part of our everyday life. And that's one of the themes that I develop in the book is that, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of uncertainty. We live with it all the time. But all too frequently, one hears scientific uncertainty offered up as an excuse to avoid making important policy decisions. Uh, but waiting un until uncertainty is eliminated <coughs> is generally impossible. And so uh, when you hear a call for uh, postponing decision making uh, uh, because of scientific uncertainty, you have to recognize that that is an implicit endorsement of the status quo. And it's often invoked as a, an excuse for uh, maintaining uh, the status quo. Now, as Jens mentioned, uh, I, I do have a, a scientific background, and in the last uh, couple of decades, I've been involved in, in climate science work, uh, taking the Earth's temperature by sending thermometers down boreholes uh, below the surface of the Earth and taking the temperature of the rocks. A basic idea is that if the atmosphere is warming, the rocks are going to feel it, and it'll be an archive. Uh, it'll be a piece of evidence that would uh, be independent, and yet uh, could confirm or deny, for that matter. But in fact, it has confirmed uh, the same story of, of uh, warming of the Earth's surface that we've gotten from uh, many other types of evidence. And from the scientific community's point of view, the fact that Earth is warming, that humans are playing a role in it, and, and that the consequences are not going to be pretty is a reasonably well-established uh, perspective. And so it's, and it's been established for, for well more than a decade. So it's puzzled me as to why, if the scientists have uh, more or less concluded that we have a problem, uh, why is it the, the non-scientific public and, and many in our government have been slow to grasp uh, the, the realities of uh, climate change? And as a result, in puzzling over that, I've spent a lot of time doing just what I'm doing now, uh, talking to people who are non-scientists, although well, many of you may be scientists, I don't know. But I've talked to uh, Rotary Clubs and Kiwanis Clubs and alumni clubs. And I've uh, accompanied eco-tourists on expeditions to interesting places. I've uh, talked with congressional staffers and legislative staffers. Uh, I've learned that you, you, you can't just talk to the choir, uh, your, your colleagues in science who already think like you do. You need to move out and, and talk with people who are skeptical or uh, simply uh, behind the times in uh, catching up with what climate science is saying. And so, uh, as I said, I've had a lot of chances to, to meet what I call mature, thoughtful, educated people and try and help them understand uh, what is happening in, in climate change. So, uh, I want to move on a little bit here and uh, talk about why there is so much uncertainty about climate science. And there are lots of reasons. Uh, some are real, some are imagined, some are manufactured. Uh, but there's a, a whole array of reasons why we are uh, sitting in a, a morass of uncertainty about climate science. Uh, humans, when they look out at the natural world and they see a tsunami that kills 300,000 people or an earthquake that uh, kills 80,000 uh, or a hurricane that floods an entire city and leads to evacuation of a half a million people, 
they sit back and, and say, wow, nature's powerful and, and I'm so puny. And they're right, of course. Nature is powerful and individually we are puny. But we don't act alone. There are six billion people on Earth that are all doing various things that collectively make humans a very powerful agent of nature. Uh, humans move more uh, Earth today than rivers do. Humans have changed uh, the composition of the atmosphere to a greater extent and at a faster rate than natural processes have at any time over the past several million years. Uh, and yet humans have a hard time grasping that they're big players in the natural arena. And so one of the, the points I continually try to make is don't underestimate yourself. Uh, again, individually, yes, you're a small player. But collectively, humans are big players on Earth today, and we have to recognize that uh, that makes us part of the problem. It also makes us part of the solution. You'll often hear humans saying, but what can I do? Uh, and once again, individually, there are things you can do, of course, but individually, you're not going to make a big dent. But collectively, through, uh, your, uh, through the electoral process, through pressure that you can bring on people who do make decisions that affect large numbers of people and, and uh, uh, large segments of our society, uh, humans collectively are very important. But really, I think that the the main reasons that there's a lot of confusion is that there's, there's a, uh, a collection of different agents uh, active in shaping public opinion that are hostile to science and simply want to uh, make people believe that science doesn't know what it's doing. Uh, they uh, want to confuse the public, uh, all of this designed to slow down the process of change, uh, change in particular in public policy, and, and therefore maintain the status quo and maintain uh, business as usual. Uh, the language that these uh, people and, and organizations and industries use uh, that lends a certain hostility or demeaning uh, character to science are such words as uh, unsound science, junk science, unsettled science, uncertain sciences. It's only a theory. Scientists don't agree. Uh, and all of those are, are seeds planted to uh, lead you to think that uh, scientists really don't have a whole lot to offer in terms of our understanding of the natural world uh, or in particular in guiding uh, policy. Uh, so I, I call these, these people the manufacturers and distributors of uncertainty. And there's a long history of this. Uh, I've just lifted some of these. Uh, the agrochemical industry and agricultural pesticides. This is what Rachel Carson wrote about uh, now almost 50 years ago. Uh, at the time that she published Silent Spring, uh, she was denounced as a, an hysterical woman with no scientific background. What could she know in the face of uh, 40 physical chemists at the industrial laboratories that produced agricultural pesticides? And in fact, the reaction of the industry was to call both the New Yorker magazine, which was serializing her work, and the publishing company that was going to put it together as a book, and, and threaten to sue uh, for defamation uh, if they went ahead with these. Well, it, it scared the, the daylights out of the publishers, but they decided they would go ahead anyway, and of course, Silent Spring was published, and it had a, a major impact in developing environmental awareness uh, in the general public. But the list is a long one. Uh, the tobacco industry and, and smoking-related health problems. This certainly is one that had a long drown-out history. And for years, we heard denials from uh, the tobacco industry that there was any conclusive scientific evidence that would tend to suggest that uh, tobacco was harmful to health. Um, in fact, I think you still hear that. And even though the tobacco industry is cautious in the USA, 
Uh, they still sell their products abroad with no warnings on it and, and widespread uh, uh, distribution. We heard it with the coal industry uh, when the, the problem of acid rain <clears throat> was presented uh, and it was suggested that the problems of acid rain in the northeast part of North America stem from uh, the coal burning power plants uh, in the Midwest that were sending high sulfur coal uh, emissions uh, into the atmosphere and which later was precipitated in the uh, east and in New England and in eastern Canada as acid rain. Uh, there was extensive denial from the coal industry that they had anything to do with that. We heard it with the gasoline industry and uh, when uh, may, some of you will remember when uh, automobiles ran on leaded gasoline. Uh, when it was pointed out that this lead was uh, being uh, widely distributed, distributed in the environment and having consequences on, on public health, particularly on, on uh, health of young people, um, the gasoline industry uh, said, we don't have anything to do with that. Uh, and even if we did, automobile engines won't run on anything but leaded gasoline. You, if you want to give up your cars, okay, but uh, you know, other than that, we can't do anything about it. Well, of course, that was nonsense. It took, uh, you know, once the, the public will was expressed, uh, leaded gasoline was quickly converted to unleaded gasoline. Uh, you still see that sign at the pump, unleaded. unleaded. Uh, and uh, environmental lead uh, in the environment uh, was uh, substantially reduced. Uh, we saw it with the synthetic chemical industry, the makers of the chlorofluorocarbons, when it was suggested that ozone depletion in the ozone hole uh, was due to uh, the presence of the chlorofluorocarbons uh, in the stratosphere. Uh, that was denounced as, as silliness. Uh, and the arguments about that uh, continued to rage for uh, fully 15 years after the science was done. And the very year uh, that the argument was still being made that the CFCs had nothing to do with the ozone depletion, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to the three scientists uh, who outlined the mechanisms by which that all took place. Uh, it was the first time that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was ever awarded in environmental chemistry. Uh, but it shows you the disconnect between what the scientists are thinking and what the, the industry and the public are thinking. And of course, in the present day, the issue of uh, putting uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere uh, by the burning of fossil fuels is uh, strongly associated in the scientific community's mind with climate change, and yet you still hear uh, denials from some segments of industry. Now, in addition to these, what I will call the industrial uh, army or division of the army, uh, there, are, there are new players in the hostility to science. And you've heard about some of them uh, here, both in Saturday morning physics and in other lectures around the campus. Uh, dealing with uh, evolution, which is a prominent theme in lecture series uh, this, uh, this term, this year. Um, but the, the creationists, the intelligent designers, don't like what science is telling them. And so they are making efforts to, uh, to uh, degrade the science, attack the science, uh, try and persuade the public that the science uh, is nonsense. Uh, and I know I'm not going to dwell on that because you've heard a lot about it. But they have a new partner, what I call an unholy alliance, um, that the creationists and the climate contras, each unhappy with science for their own reasons, have joined forces in the Michigan legislature. Here's a bill rep uh, introduced just last September that would require students to, and this is a direct quote, use the scientific method to critically evaluate scientific theories, including but not limited to the theories of global warming and evolution. Now why, why are those two there? And, and not a, 
a whole bundle of other things if you wanted to have a, a long list of things that we should be uh, having our students be acquainted with. Well, these are lumped together because each, uh, the, on the one hand, the anti-evolutionists, on the other, the anti-global warming lobbies saw a common bond of discrediting science uh, and have had this unholy alliance. Now, a third division in the army of hostility against science uh, unfortunately comes from our federal government uh, where the current administration has had a long history of uh, distorting the scientific results in exaggerating the uncertainties in suppressing science and in muzzling the scientists. Uh, just uh, within the past month, uh, there was a disgraceful incident where one of the very prominent NASA scientists, James Hansen, was uh, told that he couldn't speak uh, at certain uh, gatherings without having his speeches cleared by the public information officer uh, at NASA. And of course, the, the sideshow of that was that the public in information officer was a 24-year-old campaign worker in the previous presidential campaign who had forged his resume, had not graduated from university, and uh, was quickly fired by NASA. But that was what I call the young twit who uh, was in charge <laughs> of uh, telling Jim Hansen where he could speak and where he could not. So I, I, I don't like to put political cartoons in, but I thought I would. <laughs> I'll let you have a look at this. I think you can see it. <laughs> but this is, in fact, uh, the, the kind of barrier, the kind of uh, uh, army that is lined up uh, hostile to science and what it is telling us. And all of this, of course, makes the public uncertain. They, they don't know what to make of all of this. And the scientists themselves have not been absolutely great in, uh, in making uh, their own situation. And that's, of course, one of the reasons that I have uh, been on the lecture circuit and writing books uh, to reach, as I say, the educated, mature, uh, scientific or non-scientific community. So let's examine a little bit of the uncertainties in climate science and see if we can give you a better, a better feel for them. This is a graph that shows on the vertical axis the uh, global mean temperature change that is being predicted for the 21st century. The horizontal scale takes you from the very end of the 20th century throughout the 21st century. And it shows a whole range of possible scenarios of how the Earth's average temperature is going to unfold over the 21st century. And the, at the upper limit, uh, the temperature change is over six degrees Celsius, uh, you know, between 10 and 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, believe me, you would notice that. Uh, and at the lower end, uh, it's about one degree Celsius, about two degrees Fahrenheit. And believe me again, you would notice that. Uh, the important thing here is that no model of the 21st century predicts cooling, uh, they're all predicting warming. And what is this based on? Why is there such a range here? Uh, you can see there's green lines, blue lines, yellow lines, all with numbers on them, A1, F1, A2, A1B. All of these are, are different scenarios associated with the way that the 21st century will evolve politically, economically, and demographically. Uh, how many people will there be? Uh, what is their standard of living going to be? What kinds of energy are they going to use? And each of these lines represents a less optimistic or more optimistic scenario about how the 21st century is going to uh, evolve. It's based on models of carbon dioxide emissions, that is the, the integrated output of demographic, political, uh, energy choices and the like. And the various scenarios that go along with this in terms of greenhouse gas emissions are shown here. 
This is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, massive tome on what we can be expecting for the 21st century. And this big spaghetti diagram of, of overlapping scenarios, again with the, the same uh, coded names, A1, F1, A2, et cetera, all of those are uh, various ways that CO2 emissions might progress in the 21st century if uh, the century unfolds in different ways. Now, this principal component behind this is population. Uh, it, every person on Earth likes to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer and eat year-round and hopefully have a, a roof over their head. And all of that takes energy. And we, we need to uh, just simply know how many people are we going to have to be dealing with in the 21st century. Now, in 1976, there were, I'll start it even earlier, in 1930, there were 2 billion people on Earth. And in 1975 or so, there were 4 billion. So that was a doubling time of population of 45 years. But the doubling time earlier in Earth history was much longer, and it has been getting progressively shorter uh, so that the last doubling time was only 45 years. But what can we expect uh, for the 21st century? At year 2000, we had 6 billion people. And for the projections in, for the middle of the 21st century, they range between 8 billion on the low side and 12 billion on the high side. That's a 4 billion person range of prediction, of speculation about population. That range of uncertainty in the year 2050 was equivalent to the entire population of Earth in 1975. And so you ask about uncertainties in climate change projections. Let me see if I can go back here to this. Uh, the uncertainties are largely tied not to the uncertainties of climate science, although that certainly plays a role in it, that the bigger uncertainties are the uncertainty in demographics, economics, political will, and choices about energy that we might make over the 21st century. And so the, the issue of uncertainty in predicting the future is very real. But it's not uncertainty in climate science. It's uncertainty in social science. And it's important for you to recognize that when you hear uncertainty as a reason for not taking any action, the implicit message there is that it's uncertainties in climate science that if we just wait a little bit longer, we'll understand more. But in fact, it's uncertainties about, as I said, demographics. And you can never outweigh the future. The, you know, the future is always beyond the horizon. And uh, there's always a question of what's going to be happening 50 years hence, no matter when you decide to address the problem. And so, uh, since the future is always beyond the horizon, you can't wait for it uh, to make uh, decisions. And so, the bottom line in, in my thinking about making policy is that you just can't wait for certainty. It'll never come. You have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty, which we all do, and just simply move on without all the answers. And that is a theme I want to uh, develop uh, through uh, the rest of the time we have this morning. All right, let's see. We can ask the question, well, why should we move ahead with policy decisions in the face of uncertainty? Well, I've just mentioned a, a few, but I'll, I want to go through a, a little bit longer list here. Uh, in the first place, for those who argue, well, let's, let's do more research and, uh, and maybe you know, something will happen, uh, more research doesn't necessarily mean less uncertainty. Actually, more research frequently means more uncertainty. When you start looking at a complex system that you previously had only dealt with superficially, from the outside it looks simple, and so you, know, you think you understand it. But the more research you do and the more intricate are the feedbacks and the more 
uh, ways in which parts of the system interplay with each other, uh, you find that you, you knew much less about the system than you thought, and that the result of more research uh, is more uncertainty. And so here you spent time doing more research, and at the end of that, you're no better off than when you started, except you, of course, understand things better, but it's not, had, it's not reached the target of reducing uncertainty. The second point shown here is that there's a little bit of hubris involved in saying, well, let's just do more research uh, and we'll get the right answer or we'll find the silver bullet. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, research uh, nibbles away at problems and we do make progress, it, but it's usually incrementally. It's not a, a huge breakthrough that would fundamentally change the basis by which we uh, address a problem. And so to think that somehow we're going to be saved by some you know, major breakthrough in technology or uh, major breakthrough in political will or something like that, I, I don't think that's uh, a realistic way of looking to the future. Uh, I don't think that we're going to suddenly find our pathway. We have to experiment and try things out, move on without all the answers, but make mid-course adjustments uh, as we go. I'll come back to that in a bit. Now, the third point is that things that have long developmental timescales, such as climate change, uh, the development of the ozone hole, uh, they, if you wait around long enough to see whether things are happening in a bad way, uh, you sometimes find yourself approaching tipping points that were unanticipated where suddenly the system becomes irreversible and it moves to a new mode of behavior. Physicists are, are well uh, familiar with, with systems like that. Uh, in the case of, of the climate change uh, story, uh, possible tipping points are involved with altering the way the ocean circulation develops, uh, whether uh, when we melt all of the Arctic Ocean sea ice in the summer, whether that will uh, give us a whole new regime by replacing white ice with dark ocean water and absorbing much more heat uh, in the summertime, whether melting the permafrost, uh, which is known to contain a lot of methane and other greenhouse gas, uh, whether melting the permafrost will suddenly release a huge amount of methane, or whether warming the ocean floor uh, which takes some time because first you have to warm the ocean water, uh, but the ocean floor also has a lot of methane in it that could be released. We don't know exactly when those major changes would take place, but there are, there, they will be tipping points, and uh, I would argue that you can't, you can't wait and watch uh, forever. Uh, you have to move on, make decisions without all the answers. The last thing uh, is that in a complex system such as the climate system, uh, the causes and consequences uh, don't behave linearly. And in that context, for instance, if you continue another decade doing business as usual, it doesn't mean that it just extends the consequences of another decade. Uh, the consequences get stretched out over a much longer time. Uh, and it's much easier to deal with problems in their early stages than it is when they're full-blown and well-developed. Uh, and so just on the, the, the economics of addressing remediation of problems, uh, the economics are most favorable when a problem is first recognized. Uh, I was going to talk about that a little more in, in terms of uh, the recognition and remediation of the ozone hole, well, maybe I will squeeze it in here. This is uh, simply a look at the uh, loading of chlorine uh, in, the, in the lower part of the atmosphere, the troposphere. Uh, and uh, this comes from the chlorofluorocarbons uh, that are a synthetic chemical, actually a wonderful set of chemicals that have served us well, but they had this inadvertent problem of leading to ozone destruction. Uh, but the, in the uh, mid-70s, uh, when use of uh, chlorofluorocarbons was increasing exponentially, as shown by uh, the red line here, 
the science that began to uh, point out that it was causing problems with ozone depletion in the atmosphere was published. And so there were some initial steps taken. You, some of you may remember they banned using CFCs and hairsprays. And, uh, but the, the loadings uh, continued and, uh, and new uses were being found and the ozone depletion got worse. So uh, there was an international agreement in Montreal in uh, the late 80s, shown at the end of this little blue dash, um, that uh, banned the uh, use of the chlorofluorocarbons, and uh, the dark blue line here is the projected uh, decline of, of uh, the CFCs in the atmosphere over time. Now, actually, the flattening of the curve of the dark blue line is just about now. This is a little bit too optimistic a, a decline. Uh, but the main point is that by taking action uh, early, not quite as early as possible, but uh, earlier than simply observing it for another two, uh, two decades, uh, has led to a, uh, a situation where the ozone hole will have repaired itself probably by mid-century. We'll live with an ozone hole for about 60 years on Earth. But if you had not taken action between 1980 and 2000 and followed the red line up uh, using more and more CFCs for more and more purposes, and then decided to cut them out, the ozone hole would extend throughout the, t the century. And so it's better to address problems early. Now, I want to walk you through this long list of uh, aspects about how to move on without all the answers. First, you have to recognize that uncertainty will never be eliminated. And don't, don't be lured into thinking that we're going to eliminate uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty uh, is never going to disappear. Uh, and we live with it, as I said. We live with the uncertainty of the weather. We live with the uncertainty of the financial markets. Uh, we live with the uncertainty of war and its aftermath, uh, the uncertainty of who's going to win elections. Uh, and in fact, the, the largest industry in the world, what do you think is the largest industry in the world? Any guesses? Insurance industry. It exceeds the energy industry. Energy is number two. But the insurance industry, the largest industry in the world, uh, is centered on uncertainty about the future. And I might say that the insurance industry has been very quick to recognize the issues of climate change and the perils. And uh, has, it's one industry that has not been fighting uh, against uh, recognition of that problem. But the insurance industry uh, is centered on un uncertainty about the future. Uh, they, they do lots of research on you know, flood frequencies and when we might expect the 100-year flood or uh, the 500-year hurricane or the next magnitude 8 earthquake. Uh, this is their business. And, and they're very serious about trying to understand uh, the uncertainties uh, of the future. Now, a second point here is that the future is always full of surprises. The future is never as smooth a evolving scenario as you might expect. Uh, in terms of short-term events, uh, you don't have to think very far back. There was September 11th. Perhaps that shouldn't have been a surprise, but by and large, it was a surprise. Uh, the space shuttle Columbia uh, broke up. We saw the, the failure of the electrical utility grid in eastern North America just a couple of years ago. Uh, the Indonesian earthquake and tsunami. All of these events uh, occurring in the last five years uh, were, were surprises. Uh, none were uh, anticipated. And in a longer term basis, uh, related to economic uh, surprises, uh, who would have imagined the chaos that enveloped the deregulation of the California utility industry, and of which we're still seeing the consequences that in, in the trials of the executives from Enron uh, taking place in the present day? Uh, 
Let me give you one other example of surprises. Uh, this one is from a friend of mine, uh, Robert Lempert. Uh, here's a graph that he has prepared showing uh, the relationship between gross national product on the vertical axis and energy use on the horizontal axis. The units are not important, but the important thing here is that uh, for an historic interval of almost a century from 1890 to 1973, this is an amazing linear relationship. It's not even on a log scale. Uh, it's, it's a linear uh, relationship, and so uh, a simplistic view would simply do say that, well, in the future it's going to follow the historical trend. But there were some speculations about uh, maybe we would become more energy efficient and get more national product for less energy. Uh, and so there were some speculations shown by the dash lines that we would see a, a change in slope. Well, the big surprise was that following the energy crises in the mid-70s, uh, America actually took the lessons to heart somewhat uh, and said we can be more energy efficient and we can find ways to have a gross national product that is uh, not so uh, energy consumptive. And so uh, there are surprises. Uh, and we should just understand that the future is full of surprises. And you have to uh, uh, not try and, and look too far ahead uh, in your uh, projection of the future. Now back to this list here, uh, we talked about surprises. Uh, the to think that you can outweigh uncertainty, of course, is silly. You must make policy decisions in, uh, in the face of uncertainty. And you must not let uncertainty lead to policy paralysis. Um, the next point is, is one that flies in the face sometimes of logic. That research is not what reduces uncertainty. What reduces uncertainty is taking actions and seeing you know, how they progress. Uh, by monitoring the results of actions. Uh, and it's through, through experience, not necessarily through more research, that in big complex systems we can reduce uncertainty. But in moving ahead through action, moving on without all the answers, uh, it's important that you not take uh, anything but small steps uh, because you don't want to uh, do something so dramatic or radical and then discover, of course, that it's not a good idea. So you take small steps and in the next uh, point, and you examine many, many different pathways that might be pathways to the future and examine small incremental steps in each of uh, uh, those many pathways. Winston Churchill had some wisdom to, to give us uh, about taking small incremental steps, he said the, don't look too far into the future. The chain of destiny can be grasped only one link at a time. And I think it's, it's good insight in the wonderful Churchillian uh, fashion uh, to, to recognize that thinking that you're going to be able to predict the end of the 21st century let alone the middle of the 21st century, uh, the, that you're only kidding yourself. So you want to take small incremental steps and explore a wide range of, uh, of possible pathways uh, into the future. Don't lock into a single strategy. Now, the business of considering large numbers of future scenarios is something that in my training as a geologist we heard a lot about uh, from the president of the American Association of the Advancement of Science in the, in the end of the 19th century, uh, T.C. Chamberlain from the University of Wisconsin. And he wrote a, his presidential address of the AAAS on the, it was called the principle of multiple working hypotheses. And to a young geology student, that seemed pretty abstract and obscure. But to an old geology professor, I understand now what he was getting at. Uh, another way of, of phrasing it in a modern parlance is don't fall in love with your own hypothesis. Uh, keep lots of balls in the air. Keep exploring. 
Uh, there's an old saying that nothing is so dangerous as a man with an idea when it's the only one he has. <laughs> uh, you want to keep doubting yourself. You want to keep doubting the science. You want to keep asking, how have we made a mistake? You know, what ways are we following the wrong path? What would be the evidence that would tell us that it's time for a change? Now, the uh, next to last point on this slide, uh, seek robust strategies that do well across many scenarios. Uh, don't try and seek the optimal strategy across one scenario. That's putting all your eggs in, in one basket. Uh, the robust means that you take actions that, well, if it goes this way or that way, you know, we, we haven't done too badly. Uh, we might have done better had we made a selection and, and tried to optimize it, but we're not smart enough to know how the future is going to unfold. And so, uh, again, uh, this, some of this wisdom is ancient wisdom. Uh, it was Voltaire who said, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And if you're always striving for the optimal or the best, you're going to bypass a lot of things you could be doing along the way that are really pretty good. And so don't, don't try and strive for the best. Uh, take progress in small ways uh, and, and make sure and be, uh, be happy that you're making progress. Now, in order to uh, take step by step, small steps, and know whether you're making headway on a problem, you have to have something that monitors the future as it unfolds. Uh, you have to observe the, the consequences of your decision making. Uh, uh, you can't simply adopt a policy and say, we've solved it, let's move on to something else. You need to be looking at uh, the future as it unfolds and make uh, mid-course corrections. Now, a lot of the things that you see listed here, um, it turns out that I'm not alone in, in uh, kind of thinking along these lines. I mentioned uh, uh, my acquaintance, Robert Lempert, who has also written a book uh, dealing uh, with making long-term policy analysis. This came out about a year after my book did, and uh, his is much more technical and, and learned, uh, addressing a different uh, audience. But nevertheless, uh, the, the various concepts that I've been in, uh, unfolding here, uh, he too uh, makes them in his book on shaping the next 100 years, uh, new methods for quantitative long-term policy analysis. Now, this idea of moving ahead without all the answers, but monitoring your decisions to see if they're going where you wanted them to go, and if not, making a mid-course correction, this is called adaptive management. It's a concept that has been developed in smaller scale issues like ecosystem management, uh, but it, the principles uh, are widely applicable. And I want to, it, it, it requires a certain will to monitor your decisions. It requires a certain humility that says, I probably made a mistake. And in fact, Lempert says, you can be certain you've made a mistake uh, because you, you've not sought, you know, you've, you've just taken along a path and uh, there may turn out to be a slightly better path that you can still detour to. Uh, so you have to have a certain humility in your own decision making and your own insights uh, to, to say it's time for a change. And this is very different than a common strategy that you'll hear time and time again called Stay the course, you know? <laughs> now, is there an example of long-term policy analysis that kind of follows this uh, plan that I've uh, described of making, uh, setting a policy in place, examining its consequences, making mid-course corrections as necessary, Population management in China is not what I was thinking of, uh, and that may be a, a good example. 
The example I had in mind was the evolution of the social security system in the United States. Let's have a look at that. Social security was designed in the 1930s. It was an, uh, a, a piece of, or not a single piece, but a body of legislation that was in response to the Great Depression and the, the uh, hardships that uh, unemployed and elderly people uh, were facing. And it basically faced all the same issues that we face in aspects of the climate change problem. Because it was a system that was planning for retirement at the end of a working lifetime. And what were the uncertainties? Well, how many people would it have to support? How long would they live? What would be the, their health uh, conditions? Uh, what would be their lifestyle? Um, how would we finance it? Those are the same social science questions that are the uncertainties behind the climate change scenarios of the 21st century. And so those answers are always over the horizon. The future is never the present. And so Social Security got started but it has made a number of mid-course corrections along the way. I've listed some of them here. Uh, first is that the, the fraction of your salary that gets taxed for Social Security has changed continuously. Only upward, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, I forget what it was when I first started working in the 1950s, but uh, today it's much higher. It's a bigger fraction of, of my salary that gets taxed for Social Security. And that fraction, those changes, those mid-course corrections, have taken place periodically uh, as uh, the examination of the, uh, the trust fund and its financial stability uh, uh, changed over time. Uh, the, the rate at which Social Security is uh, taxed, this tax base is subject to a certain rate, that has changed over time. Uh, the benefits to Social Security have been tied to inflation. Uh, inflation is not something you can anticipate 100 years or, or 50 years or three generations into the future. And so we have indexed benefits to inflation. As longevity has and, and health has improved and people are living longer and retiring later, uh, Social Security payments now take place at a later age. I still get them starting at age 65, uh, but for people born uh, a decade after me, it's age 66 or age 67. And I expect that that will uh, continue to go up as, as uh, our life expectancies uh, go up. And, and just in you know, the last couple of years, we've had a, a discussion about diversifying the investment of the Social Security Trust Fund. Now, this was offered by uh, President Bush. Uh, I'm not in favor, in fact, of that uh, particular mid-course correction. But I appreciated very much that there was a lively discussion of various possible mid-course corrections that the Social Security system could take once again to recognize and meet the obligations that uh, four decades in the hence, uh, in the future, if we didn't do anything at all, we would find the Social Security Trust Fund in trouble. Now, no one's going to do business as usual for four more decades on Social Security, there will be more mid-course corrections. But uh, I, I really appreciated the educational aspect of the big discussion about the Social Security system that took place in the last two years. All right, well, what about elements of a climate change policy? Uh, the first is simply move beyond denial. Uh, get your head out of the sand, acknowledge that climate is changing, that humans are a part of it, uh, that the consequences are not going to be pretty, and that we really need to face up to this. The first and most important, because it's a timely and achievable partial solution to the problem of climate change, is simple energy conservation. This is not a high-tech solution. This is something that 
uh, is readily on the shelf or in the design cabinets of, of many of our uh, technological producers. Uh, we know how to make automobiles uh, more energy efficient. We know how to make electrical appliances more energy efficient. Uh, we, uh, we need to talk about the non-technological aspects of uh, energy conservation, such as uh, stopping urban sprawl so people are not driving so far commuting to work uh, every day. This, this makes us rethink the way our city centers function and having much more dense, densely populated city centers where people uh, live where they work. Uh, it, uh, a, a mile not driven is a certain amount of energy saved. Uh, a vehicle that gets double the fuel efficiency uh, is energy that's saved. It's the old Ben Franklin adage, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. <coughs> and it holds true for energy. Energy not used is energy in the bank. And so energy conservation uh, is something that we can do right now and could make a big impact despite the fact that our vice president has told us that conservation is only a sign of personal virtue and that, and that uh, it is not a, a basis for a comprehensive energy policy uh, it has to be a major component of an energy policy. And uh, I'm, I think that that is, is eminently achievable, and in fact, uh, in our personal lives, it's things that we can do. Uh, we need to, at the same time, as we're saving energy, we need to think of alternative energy development, uh, moving away from the fossil fuels, uh, developing uh, uh, sustainable energy, solar, wind, and the like. Uh, hydrogen will come online someday, but nowhere near the time scale that will be a significant, uh, have a significant impact on the climate problem. And I think that you need to rethink nuclear energy as well. Uh, since it's not carbon-based, uh, there may be a role for nuclear energy in the, the near term, next few decades. Uh, we have to rethink our whole approach to uh, energy, uh, the array of energy sources that we deal with. Another uh, element in a climate change policy is sequestration. Uh, this word simply means don't letting the CO2 emissions get into the atmosphere. Capture them and do something with them. Uh, you can capture some of it in, in uh, green plants because they use carbon dioxide as uh, their fuel and they give off oxygen as their exhaust product. Uh, we should be happy for that because it's what put oxygen in the atmosphere for us to, believe, to breathe. But uh, you can call on biological sequestration, but there's also physical sequestration of simply capturing CO2 at the smokestacks uh, and pumping it underground uh, into depleted uh, uh, geological reservoirs where oil and gas have been already pumped out and you can put the CO2 back in where the oil and gas came out. Uh, that's in its infancy. There's some promise uh, that it can play a role, although it's, it's certainly no silver bullet. As I think none of these are silver bullets. That's the important part of, one important part of my message is don't look for single silver bullets. Uh, you need a whole array of things that we are making progress on in parallel. Now, the last item on the list is the pessimistic one. We may be too late. In fact, I, I think we're definitely too late to avoid substantial climate change. And so, like it or not, we have to think about adapting uh, to a changing world. And it's a... Uh, it's not a, a happy uh, thought, but I think it's a realistic one. I think we're going to see changes uh, in the climate system that will lead to displacement of populations. Uh, there will be climatological refugees that rival in numbers uh, refugees from all the wars of the 20th century. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I think that this is a very real possibility. So we do have to 
think about a changing world, what are going to be the pressures of a changing world. Now, just another two minutes to close. I want to close on uh, the subject of creativity uh, because uncertainty is sometimes treated as a dirty word, but I think it's, it's a, a wonderful word because uncertainty is what drives creativity. We have a way of admiring entrepreneurs in our society, and we say that they're great because they're risk takers. But what risk is there if there's not uncertainty? If everything were certain, you'd know how things were going to unfold and there's no risk taking. And so uh, the, the very idea that people look to the future and take chances by trying something, I think is a good lesson for us. We need to, again, take baby steps in lots of different directions and try them out and see if we can move forward with the policy uh, without having uh, the, uh, the uh, uncertainty uh, whisked away. Think about certainty for a moment. When you're certain about something, you don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, it takes it off the table. There's no need to think anymore if you're certain. Uh, things, are not uh, uh, things are black and white at that point. There's no shades of gray. There's no subtlety, no nuance. And so you, you just stop thinking about things that uh, you're certain of. Uh, certainty, in a certain sense, is, is a comfort food. Uh, it, whereas uncertainty is like having a stone in your shoe. It, it hurts, and you're always reminded of it. Uh, whereas with certainty, you, you've put it out of your mind. Uncertainty leads to a competition of ideas. Certainty leads to a narrowing of thinking, uh, a, a, a much smaller view of uh, the range of ideas. So I think that science should always be probing conventional wisdom. And if there's certainty in conventional wisdom, scientists ought to be interjecting uncertainty to get us back to thinking about it. Uh, certainty is a, a false sense of security. And I think that for the creativity of the human mind to help us in the future, we have to get back to the notion that the, the, the future is very uncertain and that we will uh, do best when we take, tap our creativity that arises because of uh, the uncertainty. The last slide is a little Eastern philosophy. The Chinese word for crisis is actually two symbols that translate danger on the one hand, opportunity on the other. And I think that that is a, a, a way of thinking of uncertainty. Uh, there may be problems, perils associated with uncertainty, but there's also opportunities. And uh, the opportunities are there to be taken. Uh, the world is going to evolve differently than we grew up with it, and it's going to be the creative minds that can deal with it. And the creative minds live happily in the face of uncertainty. Thank you very much. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.